my name is Christoph, and I work for a company called 8 Light. At 8 Light, we do a lot of pair programming, and we're not only pair programming, we're pairing on all sorts of things. We write proposals together for clients, we pair on assessments for clients, sometimes we even pair on emails. So it doesn't really come as a surprise that I'm going to pair on this talk as well today. And let me introduce you to my pair. It is nice to meet you. So you might wonder who's that guy. I'm a friend of Sierra Kana. Right? Okay, so you got that titled. Let's get started. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered immediately. So who in this room knows JavaScript? That's a lot of hands, all right? So I can probably skim over the more historic parts of JavaScript because you're certainly aware of that. Um, JavaScript invented in 10 days back in 1995 by Brendan Eich, who later co-founded Mozilla. Um, got a lot of inspirations from different languages. Syntax comes from Java. Um, Perl influenced the string array as well as regular expressions handling. Scheme, thanks to Scheme, we have functions as first-class citizens. And from self, we got the prototypal inheritance. So 1995, that's 21 years now. Um, and I want to ask my pair what you think. Old, not obsolete. That's right. So it's not obsolete. And I assume many of you have seen Gary Bernard's wet talk. And well, JavaScript has its quirks, right? Um, there's no point around that. Um, but at the same time, it is widely used. It's sometimes referred to as the assembly of the web. We have so many languages transpiling down to JavaScript. So we have CoffeeScript, PureScript, Elm nowadays. Um, it's, we can even transpile C++ now even um, to have 3G, uh, 3D engines within the browser. And it is so widely adopted, yet some of the core features of it is sometimes dismissed, misunderstood, um, which is prototype inheritance, which I want to talk, which I want to talk about today. And while talking about prototype inheritance, there's also classical inheritance. So we also go a little bit into that. So both objects come from the object-oriented world. And I want to ask you, like, what is it actually about? What does object orientation mean? Problem is, like, we all have some sort of understanding for that, but nobody really agrees on one single definition. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, you ask 10 people, you get at least 11 different answers for that. So in general, inheritance, encapsulation, composition, delegation, polymorphism, all these things somehow relate to that. Uh, but uh, to get to the gist of it, Alan Kay is attributed to be to, to have coined the term object-oriented programming, and some some are referred to co having co-invented OO in general. And he has one definition for it: OOP to me means only messaging, local retention and protection, and hiding of state process, and extreme late binding of things. So that refers more to the encapsulation part of it. Um, second person worth noting is uh, Chris Nigard, computer, science, uh, computer scientist from Norway. Most of the time attributed like in, like you always hear Alan Kay and Chris Nigard mentioned in the same sentence. Um, his influence um, to, the, to ob object oriented programming comes mostly from Simula uh, 76. And his notion was like OO programming, OO programming is where a program execution is regarded as a physical model simulating the behavior of either a real or imaginary part of the world. So this goes more into the modeling part of object orientation. Think of it like the usual examples of shapes. Circle is a shape, a car is a vehicle, a car has an engine, and all these sorts of things. So Simula 76 um, was the first language that actually introduced classes, objects, and inheritance. Um, and yeah, Nigard was one of the inventors. So. To go deeper in it, into it, there are three more terms we need to discuss. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> Not quite the terms I was referring to, but we need to talk about what is a class, what is an object, and last but not least, what is actually a prototype. So class, what is a class really? It's a generator of objects. You could call it as a factory, like every class is a factory of its objects. Um, Sometimes you could also imagine it as some sort of cookie cutter. Put that cookie down now! Well, okay, so more 
a class is kind of an abstract example of the thing you want to use. Um, it rep represents some generic representation of a thing. We get into more details later. Um, thing is, every language differs in one way or another. Um, the term class doesn't necessarily mean the same, th the same thing across languages. In Ruby, for example, you can use a class and pass it around as a value as well. In Java, you can kind of do that. You have this dot class attribute. Um, in C++, you don't have the chance at all. Um, next thing on the list, object. Also referred to as an instance. That's where the like, you say this thing is an instance of class whatever. Um, you, you see the word instance mostly used in class-based languages, and it's really it's a runtime representation of that particular class. The idea behind that is also it is fully encapsulated. That's where Alan Kay's definition comes into play again, like hiding the state and encapsulating all the behavior that is needed to fulfill its job. And objects can be rigid, sometimes very flexible. It's, again, every language differs. Um, JavaScript, for example, lets you define new methods on an object or new functions on an object. So does Ruby. In Java, you can't really do that. You have an object in Java, and you cannot change it. You can change the state, but you cannot attach new methods. Um, a prototype. So prototype was the concept of prototypes was introduced in a paper by Alan Borning, um, classes versus prototypes, mid-80s, I think. Um, and he goes into detail about how a prototypal approach can help teaching programming to students in an easier way, because he and his colleagues, and he, he's seen that in the industry, struggled with explaining the concept. He refers to, scheme, uh, to small talk in that example. Small talk gets relatively nifty when you think of all the meta classes and everything involved. So he made a point explaining this with prototypes and showing that you basically can represent the same concepts and implement the same behavior with a different approach. Main thing is a prototype is not a class. It's really just an object. Um, and you can think of that in a way that a class is something like you would imagine like a model house. You kind of live in there. You can't also really use it to build your real house. But a prototype, on the other hand, is more like a blueprint for the thing you want to build. You can use a blueprint to actually build your house. Um, this is how a prototype looks like, at least in JavaScript. Very fancy, um, but we get into more details. Um, creating new objects based on a prototype. As I mentioned, a prototype is just an object. This is a really dumb one because it doesn't define any properties. But for the sake of explaining it, um, then you create an object based on that prototype with the object create function. And then you get another object. And because, again, prototypes are just objects, you can use this new object also as a prototype for yet another object. So a prototype is really more a concrete example of a thing you try to model it within your problem domain. Um, the nice thing about that is because it's a concrete example, it's basically an ex executable example as well, and you don't need to worry about a separate concept between you have these classes on this side and you have objects on the other side. You only have objects. So what you see there is the behavior what you have. So it's more really like a template. Or actually um, like a stamp. There's a stamp it library as well by Eric Elliott, highly recommendable. Um, it's you use it as a stamp to create these new objects for you. And to show the difference between classes and objects, I'm going to use Ruby as an example here. So Ruby has a string class. And you can ask this class, hey, what methods do you have? And then you get back a list of uh, methods you can call on this particular class. You see new there in, in order to create new um, objects. You can ask it for its constants, for its private methods, public methods, and so on and so forth. Then when you create a new string in Ruby, you um, can also ask this object for its methods. And here you see you get back a different list of methods. So here, th these are the methods you can actually call on a particular string instance. So you can upcase it, you can downcase it, you can split it, reverse it, you name it. Um, so 
this is what you can call during the runtime of your program, for example. You have an instance and um, you call these methods or properties on a particular object. How does it look like, actually? Let, let's compare how the runtime lookup um, is different from prototype-based and class-based languages, starting with the class-based lookup. Um, Ruby example code again, we define a class A with an attribute foo and some pseudo UML on the right-hand side. Um, then we create a class B that subclasses A, and we create another subclass C that inherits from B. And then we create an object of this uh, last class C and ask it for its attribute, foo. Like, hey, foo, what is your value? What is happening now during runtime? The runtime will ask the class of thing, which is C, hey, what's your value? Wh what's the value for foo? And because it's not defined on C, it doesn't find anything. So what is it, what's the runtime doing then? It's asking something very specific. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Exactly. <laughs> so because it's not defined on C, it will go up the inheritance chain and ask, hey, B, do you have a value for the attribute foo? It doesn't have it, so it will continue. I'm not playing that again, don't worry. Um, it will continue go walking up the inheritance uh, tree until it finds, hopefully eventually, finds the um, actual attribute. Here it is defined on A, and yes, we can return the value. It's nil in this instance, but just for the sake of explaining it. If it wouldn't be defined on A in Ruby, it would continue actually. There is this implicit parent class object, which has yet another parent class basic object. And it actually gets a little bit more tricky because there's also module lookup going on. Um, I left that out for, for the example. But it's basically like it tries to find something until it reaches the end and then says, okay, yeah, nowhere defined, sorry. How does this look like in a prototype-based language? Um, we define an object, which we will use as a prototype. And on the lower right-hand side, again, some pseudo UML. Um, this prototype just defines one property, bar, with the value 42. And then we create a new object based on this prototype called thing. And we then can, just because it's JavaScript, uh, we can just define a new attribute on that as well, assign it a string hello. And when we execute that and ask, hey, think, what's your value for foo? Well, that's not very surprising. We get back the string hello. So what happens now when we ask for bar? As you would imagine, it's not defined on thing. So what is happening then? Who is your daddy and what does he do? So yet again, because thing's prototype is the other object, it will continue looking up there. So. It is defined on bar, and then, yeah, actually, we get back the value. And very similar to how it is done in the classical language, um, if it wouldn't be defined there, it will continue walking up or walking the prototype chain until it reaches null, which defines the end of the chain. And then it would de de uh, return undefined for that. So you might think, well, that looks pretty, pretty similar. And I would say, yes, you're right. Um, it's not about changing the way you program or it's not change like using prototype inheritance doesn't change how your programs behave but it changes how you model and structure your software so with classes you apply some kind of taxonomy you categorize you classify things into names nouns usually um, with prototypes you more you refer more to the actual behavior um, you have very specific prototypes as an example for, okay, we have this, think of, to use a Java example, you have this serializable interface, if somebody knows that. Um, think of it in, in these terms. Like you define a prototype based on the behavior it tries to represent. All right, enough philosophy. I better get going. Okay. So coming back to object-oriented programming, what does it really mean? Unfortunately, the consultant in me has to tell you, well, it depends, right? Thanks for the tip. Okay. Object-oriented programming with prototypes. Um, it's really the focus on behavior. Um, as I mentioned just, now, just before, um, instead of creating all these taxonomies for the concept in your problem domain you're trying to solve there, um, you focus on behavior. Think of traits if you use to Scala 
or um, Java 8 now has default methods on, on interfaces. Think of it in this way. Um, a prototype in JavaScript can be any object. Prototypes are responsible for like defining this behavior. It al they also have some kind of state, um, but they don't have any special methods or there's nothing special involved in order to use prototypes. It's really just, it's just another object and you will use that to define your new objects. How's a prototype used then in that way? Um, we've seen that before, object.create is your friend. And to show an example, the judgment date from predicted in Terminator, the movie is way past, so let's help Skynet to actually create some Terminators. So we define a Skynet prototype here with um, a boot function to actually boot it up, and then it starts the mission and the mission is kill all humans, as you would expect from the movies, and in the kill all humans function, you would see the usual code. For now, we do something more peaceful, we just lock something. So then we can create a new instance of that Skynet prototype and boot it up, and off the Terminator will go, and we can create thousands of them. So now, because this wasn't very um, effective, Skynet itself said, okay, well, we need a better Terminator here. So we will duplicate, like we will create another Terminator based on another Terminator and overrides its mission. So instead of just killing any random human, we will specifically target John Connor, right? Boot it up and off he goes. Different mission, special mission. So this can be done by anyone and future John Connor from the movie um, says, well, I can do the same. Instead of, but instead of killing me, this one here, T101, will actually save me. He will find me and save me. And because of this function, you should trust this guy when you see him. Come with me if you want to live. So, all very created, um, yeah, all arbitrary examples, but what is it actually I try to achieve here? So, JavaScript don't really follow the there's only one way to do it pattern uh, or philosophy from um, Python. It has Perl influence, right? So there's definitely more than one way to do it. Um, I do like the Zen of Python approach. That, like, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Unfortunately, we're not there. We, you ha we have a plethora of frameworks in, in JavaScript that all try to solve the same problems in a different way. Um, some use a prototypal approach, some use a, try to use a class-based approach. Um, my main point is don't fight the language you're using. Um, not necessarily saying don't use, don't use it in a way it was intended to, but don't let unfamiliarities prevent you from using, for example, JavaScript's true powers, because the prototype prototype approach is really, really flexible, and you can write. Obviously, you can write the same software, but even with less code and less overhead, because you don't need to worry about um, trying to have something like a class. Um, all the um, Weird behaviors you sometimes see with a new operator. Um, you don't really know where this, this binding happens. Um, if you stick to just the prototype away in JavaScript, um, at least these two categories of errors are not an issue anymore. Um, prototype chain is, I would consider that the ultimate delegation because it's backed into the, fe uh, into the language itself. Think of it as the chain of responsibility pattern, just as a language feature as well. Um, I, when I tried to explain it to a, to a friend, I kind of called it the hot potato because, well, I cannot handle it. L let someone else take over it. I just delegate to my uh, um, prototype and ask, then maybe he or like this thing knows what the property is. And if you've read the Gang of Four book, um, there's a saying, or like it's a general saying now, favor composition over inheritance. Um, with the prototypal approach, this is really a language feature as well, because you can only compose your objects based on other objects. You don't inherit, not necessarily. Um, you don't try to inherit. You just say, okay, I have this object as an example. I will create a new object from it. I will maybe extend it in a way, like provide new, new methods, uh, like attach new methods to it, and then I have something new, uh, which I can also use in a different way later on. And that's really the main, the core feature of it. You, you, I said that before, but you don't have a separate 
thing that you need to learn. It, it, it's not a hard concept to learn, I admit that, but you don't have something else that defines the structure or the behavior of the thing you're using. You only have this one thing you're using, which is an object. There's no class. And I swear to God, I had this quote in before, but to paraphrase Douglas Crockford on that, um, it doesn't get more old th than that. Um, and on that note, I can open the round for questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, good presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask, do you think there is a way to stop the community from using classes or something which is not in Diomatic in terms of JavaScript? Uh, and I think it's, it's really worth to point out that JavaScript is really or object-oriented language, yeah. while Java, for example, is class-oriented uh, programming, actually, not object-oriented programming. So do you think it's possible now with the Angular 2 and the, the decorators uh, to stop, to, to explain people that maybe it's good to use idiomatic feature and like you said, not, not to fight with your language? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good question. So, but let me elaborate a little bit about the object-oriented part of it. Like Java is also object-oriented. The difference is not being object-oriented or classical. The object, uh, the difference is classical or prototype-based. So all of all of the language, of both of the language we just mentioned are object-oriented. Um, if the community can change, will change, I'm not sure. Um, the thing is, I don't impose this new pattern. I'm just saying um, try, use, try to use it as it was intended to. Um, unfortunately, there are, let, let me take back the unfortunately part. Um, there are many, many big frameworks out there that do a great job and they do the class-based approach in JavaScript, which, I mean, it's more familiar to people, and I think you can attract more people with it just because usually when you learn something like Java or Ruby beforehand, before you go to a language like JavaScript, um, it's more familiar to you, so you can get started in a more easy way. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't have a direct answer to that question if that can change. I hope it will change because prototype inheritance is quite powerful and I would like to see more of that. 